Hi there, this is Sherry Hayes with MomDelights.com and today I'm going to be talking to you about homeschooling high school and especially as it pertains to the Charlotte Mason method. As you know, things have been changing in our country. Things have been changing in the world and a lot is being exposed and I'm so, so happy about it because if you know anything, if you followed me for any amount of time, if you read my blog posts or you've even watched me vlogging for a while, you'll know that I am of the impression that our educational system has been broken for many, many decades. Even maybe in some areas, maybe all the way back to the 1830s. And here I'm talking especially about in the state of Massachusetts, <laughs> where it all started. And um, I think that that's that's just a natural outcome of human nature, natural new human nature, I know it's redundancy, but um, if you want to make a change in a society, you start with the children and the education system, especially if it's nationalized and if it's compulsory, meaning that if you don't take your kids to school, you'll get in trouble with the government. When you have that kind of control over the younger people, you will um, try to control the curriculum and the methods so that you can train up a society in the way you want it to go. <laughs> and so I believe that our society has been, um, that our educational system has been messed up for many, many, many years. And it's been controlled, it's been taken over by people who don't necessarily have God's best in mind for us. You know what I'm saying? They may think in their minds like they're saving the earth or they're bringing a, a new evolution of humankind into a new age of Aquarius or, you know, that's not so far-fetched. They actually speak like that. Then in their minds, they're doing us a favor by taking over the educational system, taking children away from their families, teach training children to suspect their parents and their elders, all that kind of stuff. But However, here we are homeschoolers just quietly over in our little corners of the world making a difference or however we can in little incremental bits and sometimes those incremental bits cannot seem so big but I have actually observed that over the time that homeschooling has become more mainstream that actually homeschoolers have affected some changes in the way we look at things and sometime I'll have to put that all together so that I can explain that. But for today we're talking about high schooling and homeschooling and Charlotte Mason and all that because Charlotte Mason sounds so great for younger kids. I mean you know you just read to them or they read and they narrate and we write narrations and then and then we you know we just explore outdoors and all that but when you get into high school we go oh my goodness what am I gonna do because in schools they're like you know they're living they're doing all the higher math and the higher sciences and, and stuff like that and that's not against Charlotte Mason's um, ideas at all but is there a way that you can keep that kind of a sweet gentle like self-directed learning kind of thing going on in high school and can you take control of the content so that you're not just all of a sudden putting in a whole bunch of worldly ideas and methods just so they can be prepared for college, 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 university, college, college. And so um, I, I have talked a lot about how you don't have to have college and university in order to be a successful person. In fact, in these days especially, it's probably best if you keep your kids away from colleges and universities as much as possible. Now there are some areas I know that people say like if you want to be an engineer you got to go to university, right? But can you minimize the impact of that by not sending your child away to the university? Can you do a lot of that stuff online? Are there like some testing out? You can do some of the really awful things. Uh, can you suggest alternatives to some of the more egregious like you know really um, so we say socialized parts of the university education. Are there, there are ways you can do it? I mean, there are a million ways to skin a cat, right? Um, but for the rest of the kids that aren't necessarily going to go to be engineers, keep them as close to real human adult life as you can. That is my advice. That is what I've seen in my own kids, and it's what I suggest. Just keep their curriculum, keep the things that you present to them as close to adult life that's going to be real adult life as you can and not necessarily this part of adult life 
where we have kids in this cocoon until they're 24 and all of a sudden they come out with these really weird ideas that are just, you know, like they fester inside the halls of some some university someplace where real life never touches them, you know, where mom and dad, you know, they, they get credit cards or their mom and dad, you know, and all of a sudden they're foisted down into real life where these theories that they learn in the university don't work. <laughs> and so um, it's kind of a rude awakening, but I think I'm getting ahead of myself. Here are the principles that I suggest that you teach high school homeschoolers, okay? It's the truth is that academics, the real academics that people really use in real life don't take that long to inculcate into kids. Now, John Taylor Gatto says it takes about 60 contact hours to teach a human being how to read and write and do arithmetic so that they can function as adults. Now, this is why you hear about the people who have all the, the you know, they have their own business and they're very successful and they only had an eighth grade education. Did you know that the Amish only have eighth grade educations and they do quite well in business, I'd say. Now, in that those eighth grades, when they reach the, like the seventh and eighth grade, they're learning bookkeeping and business math, not necessarily algebra and geometry because, to be honest, I like doing algebra, I like doing geometry, but I really rarely ever have used it as an adult <laughs> and I consider myself to be a model success um, so really we don't have to spend a lot of time during the high school years on those things except to hone them and make them like more productive shall I say um, during the elementary years that's when we're really learning the mechanics right but then when they get in high school you want to take those things and broaden them um, now, the real curriculum, the real curriculum that you want to have in high school are these two things. These two things are the main things. The main thing is not getting them ready for college or university. i got to tell you the truth. There are shortcuts. One of the major shortcuts, if your child has to do the university college thing or if they're just determined, you know, and that's okay. You know, you have to let them be adultish type people and make some decisions. You can do community college and online courses for the basic freshman year credits and make sure they're transferable, but it is, doesn't have to be that intense kind of, like sending a child off to university. Most state universities require them to live in co-ed dorms and all kinds of stuff. But if you can like get them so they can transfer and take that freshman year and have them learn those freshman things in a non-intensive way, that's really the way to go. But anyway, I have gotten down another rabbit trail. So what we got to do is at home, these are the two things that you have to do. You have to do this. And why? Because you're not going to teach them how to, go to, how to go to college. You're going to teach them how to live. Because it doesn't matter who they are or where they come from or what they plan on doing, they're going to have to live in a house and get along with people and they're going to have to have moral direction and they're going to have to learn how to take care of their stuff, right? I was watching this show. I don't know how I got into it. I think it was The Daily Connoisseur. She mentioned this show, um, How to Clean Your House or, or How Clean Is Your House. It was a British uh, thing and then, I, then that led me to read to, I mean, to watch home, House to Home, and it had like one of the same characters, and her name is Kim something. And I was just like, I got glued to this show for a while. <laughs> and I was just watching. My kids were like laughing at me. Um, but I kept watching the show, and I watched these poor people, and I realized, how do people get to be the hoarding, filthy? I mean, you know, they don't even have to be hoarders. I mean, just life just happens. And there are a lot of us whose houses look kind of close to the hoarders and we don't mean to. It's because we don't know what to do with ourselves. We don't know what to do with our homes. No one teaches anybody this stuff anymore. We all grew up with moms who were working, most of us, right? And my mom, thankfully, would take every Saturday and we would clean, every Saturday morning we knew we would clean the house from the week. And um, she was not a clutterbug, thank God. <laughs> But um, and and but she, my my grandmother and her, she was she started out a homemaker and then she became divorced and then she was pretty clean. But I would go to my friends' houses, and their moms would work or not, but they just, I mean, they were just like junk heaps, you know. And 
I think that most of us live, have, have grown up and have lived in a kind of a culture that says if you're at home, that's where you relax, but you don't work there. You just relax. And, and the, the, if there's any work done, the mom does it. And the kids, I mean, they already go to school, so mom doesn't make them do anything. So no one does any chores. You grow up, you don't even know what to do. Like, like, are you supposed to clean the cobwebs out in the corners of the room? Or, like, who does that? Isn't that the maid's job? Or, you know, what, <laughs> what do we do with ourselves? So if we can do anything, we've got to teach our kids how to live. And also relationships. Um, how to make decisions, like what do you base your decisions in life on? We've got to give kids a moral compass, you know? So you got to teach the Bible and its principles to your kids, okay? Um, now, I'd like to give you some quotes here. You know, I mean, a lot of us have thought, well, the Bible is a good book, but I don't really understand it. And I can pull out some verses here and there that have really been meaningful to me, but I don't understand really what that book's about. And people are saying that it's like got some misogynistic, maybe some, um, maybe there's some, some social issues that need to be addressed that the Bible kind of might be a little backwards on. And we've got this idea in our minds that, you know, we have these two conflicting things. We love God and we love Jesus and we want to know about him. But then we've got this other thing over here that says maybe the Bible has some problems. I can't really trust it. I could just trust the good parts, right? And so another video I'd like to take and we're going to work through all that kind of stuff. And we're going to try to make sense of what that really means. But on the other hand... Um, I'd like to read to you some quotes just from some past presidents and what they said about the Bible, okay? Now, this is from Teddy Rose, the Theodore Roosevelt, okay? He said, The teachings of the Bible are so interwoven and entwined with our whole civic and social life that it would be literally impossible for us to figure to ourselves what life that life would be if these teachings were removed. Now, you could say that lots of these teachings have been removed. But, believe it or not, the foundational basics of what our country was founded on, our whole justice system used to be founded on, was the Bible and its principles. Okay, John Quincy Adams said this, and this will, you know, kind of bolster what I just said. The first and almost the only book deserving of universal attention is the Bible. So much for it being a secular government. I speak as a man of the world, and I say to you, search the scriptures. That's John Quincy Adams. Okay, He was the sixth president, by the way. Now, Andrew Jackson, the seventh president, had this to say. That book, sir, is the rock on which our republic rests. Now, you may not like Andrew Jackson or his policies, but he knew something. He knew that the republic that our country originally was rested on the Bible. Okay. Abraham Lincoln said this, In regard for this great book, I have this to say. It is the best gift God has given to man. All the good Savior gave to the world was communicated through this book. Okay, so there are reasons why you need to know the Bible. And here's something that I like to go by. I like to say that even though I may not understand everything in the Bible, that's probably because my brain's wrong, not because the Bible's wrong, All right? So I let the Bible change my mind. I don't judge the Bible by my mind because I figure the God who made my mind has the only right, is the only one who has the right to change my mind. Yep. Okay, so I'm going to read some other scriptures. Here's from the Bible speaking about itself. Proverbs chapter 1. Verse 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. If you can just get that one idea into your kids' brains, you know, even if they go off on wild tangents, that will be back there. Ding, 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 ding. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, right? the beginning of knowledge. You know, we think we have all this knowledge about everything, but we don't need God. Let me tell you something. Without God, you wouldn't even have a brain to think with. <laughs> okay, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 6. Now, this is one of my husband's favorites. He quotes this all the time. 
Um, okay. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Ah, see, when those life principles, how to make decisions. You've got to trust the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your pea brain and he'll be able to direct your paths and make them straight. And that's how you make decisions. <laughs> One of those basic principles, right? So I like to think that those are some of the major things that we need to give our kids in high school. Now, you can do that the Charlotte Mason way. You can have them take a theme, like such as love, go through the Bible, learn all about love, write an essay about it, write it in the formal way with a thesis statement, a thesis paragraph, three with, with three, you know, points, and then each, do three paragraphs explaining, sorry, lots of noise, explaining those three points, and then a conclusion paragraph. That is so easy, you know, but they're all different types. There's persuasive and everything. And I think the Robinson curriculum site has an actual article in there on the different types of um, essays and you can read it to your kids and then assign them, like pick something and assign that. <laughs> That's pretty easy. Um, the second thing we want to really make sure, I, I talked about the Bible and its principles. The second thing is life skills. Life skills, life skills, life skills. When you have teenagers in high school, they are just actually young adults. They are just, you're, they're just people, right? They're just young people. And young people need to know things. They need to know things like, they need to know things like how to take care of a car, how to take care of their clothes. They need to know how to nourish their bodies. They need to know um, what is a mortgage? What is compound interest? Um, you know, what is, how do you vote, you know, and why is that important? What is a bond issue? Um, they need to know all these different things, okay? They need to be familiar. They need to watch you as you do them. They need to learn about these things. These are not just incidentals. You know, in a high school curriculum, they might have this little tiny health class, you know, that's a half hour a week or something like that. That's not enough person who doesn't want to have one of those hoarding filth bucket houses or just a house that is perpetual and you don't even know what to do with it, is you've got to take some time and you've got to teach some things. You've got to be an example yourself, right? Let me read you a really cool quote from a book I just found this last night, like, yesterday. So yesterday, my husband and I, we went antiquing, which was a lot of fun and it's better than going out to eat because you spend a little money, but it's the same amount of money. You would spend a lot of, lot of money on eating, and then it just goes in your body and goes out. But if you go out antiquing, then you find something interesting, and you get to keep it. <laughs> anyway, so I'm going to read. This is um, Home Economics. This was printed in 1915, but its original copyright was 1898. And it's not a textbook. This is a book that you could just buy at the store, okay? And this is the, from the preface. I'll read one, one paragraph. It says, Home economics covers a vast field to which nearly all the arts and scientists contribute. Few women have the time to devote to investigation and experiment in all the lines that bear upon the making of the home. In these days of specializing, it would take a large library and much time to cull from the various sources the kinds of knowledge that bear directly upon the making and management of the home. Yeah, just think about it. You have to know so much to have a home that is clean and orderly and comfortable and inviting and worthy of having guests. You know what? And is nourishing and helpful. There is so much to learn. And it and it covers all the scientists, covers history, covers philosophy, it covers, you know, just about art, music, everything. I mean, it's it's just all there. You have to use all of it. I think one of the most creative, technical, amazing jobs in the world is just being the, the wife and mother of a home where people feel comfortable. I mean, it's just amazing. Okay. The aim of this book is to supply such knowledge. Anyway, so I have been actually reading this aloud to my girls and they're loving it. They're eating it up. This, this, is the, this was written during the time where they still like used wood and coal in the stove when they made their dinner. <laughs> and so there's so many fascinating things. There's like a whole chapter on carving and I thought, she talks about wood carving? No, it's a whole chapter on carving different meat. Can you believe it? 
think someone is above me walking back and forth. Doesn't that sound? Can you handle that? <laughs> okay, anyway, um, so homemaking is not just about doing some sweeping, washing the dishes, maybe some laundry. <laughs> it's a lot more. It's a lot more extensive than that. So, also, um, so those are the, the, the basics, you know, like life skills and biblical principles. And if you're going to go into history, make sure that history is taught from the perspective of analyzing all of it in light of God's intentions for man. Okay, it's not just about, you know, it's not just about a whole bunch of random, you know, random events that people did. And, I mean, it's all connected. It's all connected with God's plan. And if you can find some resources, now I'm going to suggest some, and I've talked about them before, because um, it's important when, when your children enter a certain age, they don't look at you as though you're like they're the hero in their eyes. Little children look at their parents as being the heroes in their eyes, right? But then when they get older, they see you and they see you, you know, like they look at you and they see your flaws because they're getting older and they understand things more. And so then they start to question, well, just because mom and dad told me this, is this really the way I want to live? Is this really the right thing? And it's not bad because I hope my kids get farther in the Lord and have better lives than me. So I don't mind if they question a little bit. Maybe it's good. I, I mean, I can see my own foibles. I'm okay with that. But you want to make sure they keep the kernels of truth that you taught them. So this is when you have to bring in other voices to support the things you've tried to teach them. Um, people that you want to introduce them to are those such as C.S. Lewis and G.K. Chesterton. And you want them to read biographies of different saints and heroes such as Hudson Taylor, Elizabeth Elliot, uh, Corey Ten Boom, William Wilberforce, Charles Finney, um, you can even do uh, oh, Abraham Lincoln or, um, oh, I can't think of his name, Benjamin Franklin, all those kinds of guys. George Washington is great. And um, there are some resources you can use that have a godly perspective on these things. One of them is Wall Builders has a number of different books and they totally dispel the idea that we only have a secular country just built on secular principles and that all the founding fathers were either deists or rationalists or, or uh, you know, everything. If you read their stuff, you get quotes and quotes and quotes and quotes and quotes that will go, oh, well, there's no way. <laughs> anyway, so they have books and they have videos and they have all kinds of stuff. And William Federer is another one of those. And what he does is he takes, he'll help you see the big picture. He, and that's what he does in his lectures and stuff. He has so much cool stuff. He has cool books he has out. And when you read his books, you'll see that through, there's, there, there are patterns of humanity that happen over and over and over again. And where we go from freedom to bondage to freedom to bondage to freedom and bondage. You, you'll see it. It's really cool how he does it. He's just very, he's an interesting man. He's taught at our church before in Colorado. It was fun. Okay, so during this time, while that's all in your, in your intro, introducing all these amazing things, you're bolstering it. Also, Will Witt, I'm sorry, I didn't mention. Will Witt is another one of those, and um, there are others that you can get. Will Witt uh, has a book. Now, we have this book, and one of my daughters is reading it currently, and it is How to Win Friends and Influence Enemies. And so that's what she's working through. So there's all kinds of stuff like that. I mean, all kinds of speakers. And what you do is you bolster what your the truths you're trying to get across to them. You bolster them with these other voices so that now they're learning these things, and now you're having conversations back and forth, and they're teaching you stuff, <laughs> which is really a lot of fun in high school. You can have a lot of fun with your kids. I learned so much from my uh, teenage children and my young adults. I learned so much from them. I just It's just a lot of fun. Um, so homeschool, high school, it never really ends. I mean, I know, um, like, you want to wanna have a stopping date. Like, we'll say, you know, you're 18 in June. We'll just, like, we won't formally do anything after that. You know, you can get a job. You can do whatever you need to do. But any homeschool high school that's been that's been taught correctly they know that past that point now it's up to them but they just never stop learning they never stop gaining knowledge they never stop analyzing things they're just are that's like ingrained in their minds that's a method 
especially with Charlotte Mason, it's a method that's been so ingrained in their minds that they never stop the rest of their lives. You can talk to them 15 years, 20 years later. I talk to my eldest daughter all the time. And, you know, she's just never stopped homeschooling herself. <laughs> she's homeschooling her own kids now. And it's just like, you know, we have the richest conversations because she just has never stopped, you know, because learning never stops. We never stop growing. We never stop moving forward. And so those are some of the basic things that I wanted to share with you about homeschooling high school and the Charlotte Mason method. Um, I hope you like it. And we'll just keep exploring more fun things like this because I know this has been a question like, Someone has been asking continually about what books are there for boys. Ah, I gotta do that. And I'd like to do also delve into the Bible and how to understand it and how to teach it because I could just say, we'll just read it out loud and talk about it, but I know there's much more to it than that. And there's so much confusion, confusion out there right now. And so I'd like to like give some basic principles for that. That would be fun. And so I love you. Thank you so much for all your comments and your encouragement. And I am still working on the planner and I have actually switched from Microsoft publisher to affinity publisher software because it doesn't have a cloud and it's just like Adobe InDesign. So I am experimenting with that and I'll have to show you a video on that because I know a lot of people have been wondering about that. And, um, the, uh, affinity, a publisher that I'm using only cost $55 and then you own it and they do updates for free. So if you would like more information on that, I can do a video on that. Just leave your comment below and <laughs> you have a great day. <laughs> Please like and subscribe. And if you leave a comment, I guess it's supposed to help with the, log the algorithm. Bye-bye. <laughs>